like to con reconvene the meeting for the St. Mary's County Board of Education for Wednesday, March 11th, 2020, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have a motion to approve the agenda. I move approval of the agenda as presented. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll begin with the board report. Yeah. All right. So on Monday, I went to the Great Mills Rising Freshman Night. And for part of the presentation, I talked a little bit about the importance of student voice. And this was a message that I really wanted to convey to the incoming ninth graders because I specifically remember coming in as a freshman and I wanted to make changes in the school and get involved, but I really didn't know where to start or rather who would listen. So that's what led me to student council, which is something I absolutely love. And clubs like student council and PAC and Slack are always looking for new students to give their thoughts and concerns, uh, which brings me to Advo Advocacy Day, where the St. Mary's Association of Student Councils is taking 12 delegates from all three of the high schools tomorrow to go to Annapolis and talk with public officials to give their thoughts on some of the proposed bills and give them feedback. And yeah, that's all I have. That's pretty exciting. Well, that sounds really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, last week, I had the opportunity to um, see three students with the Academy of Visual and Performing Arts or Capstone Project which was over at the art gallery in Leonardtown. Um, these students, when they present their, uh, their capstone project, they, you know, they get up, they, you know, great job public speaking and explaining their art projects and how they came about that, that particular study, whether it was a particular artist or a style. Um, great artwork. Um, I just really enjoy going and seeing the talent that our students have. So, uh, last uh, a couple weeks ago, I attended the um, uh, ChapterCon concert that was uh, sponsored by Mr. Burroughs and uh, Mrs. Washington and Dr. Smith attended. And I'm going to let them talk a little bit about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see, I also joined Mrs. Weaver and Mrs. Washington at the AVPA presentation for the capstone. Um, hats off to all of the students and uh, uh, Lindsay Robertson who was their, um, their mentor <laughs> slash teacher during that whole process and from what we were told, I think there were three this year, I think there's seven next year. And, and ten then the following Ten or year. eleven the following year. Huge so class. hats off to, uh, to, to Chopticon for, con and for continuing to support that program. Now they're, they're at the point where they have to look for another space because they, there's not enough room at the Arts Council. Uh, last week was the, uh, our School Safety Advisory Commission meeting, um, which advises the Maryland Center for School Safety. The main topic was vaping. Uh, apparently it is a, as we all know, it is a struggle for school systems and police officers and uh, social workers and counselors throughout the entire state. Uh, we talked a little bit about different programs that are present in the schools, but um, the main, the main, I guess, concept that came out of it is that the removal of the possession charge um, when the legislature increased the, the age to 21, what a lot of the school resource officers are now finding is that they have kids that are dealing vapes and they are dealing with THC and other substances inside of them. And without having that tool of a possession charge, then they cannot stop that influx of um, maybe controlled substances or other substances into the schools. Uh, there was one school system where they were selling vape pods where they filled it with um, straight bleach cleaner. And the child uh, bought it and ingested it. So um, once again, my public service announcement, even if you think that your kids aren't doing it, I will probably tell you that they are because all the parents that I talk to that they tell me that they aren't. I watch their kids in the parking lot vape before they go into school, practice, whatever. So um, even if they do, at least talk to them about it and just make sure that they're safe because um, that student at that school went out in an ambulance. Um, and it, you know, so it was, it was clearly 
Um, it's clearly an issue. Everyone's struggling with it. There's not a clear answer. Um, so just talk to your kids and make sure that you know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Wow. I attended Town Creek Elementary School and they had Read Across America as many of our, our schools did in celebration of Dr. Seuss's birthday and to encourage the love of reading. I want to thank mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Todd Morgan who came to read to the students and they really enjoyed that. The teachers and students were dressed up in costumes uh, relating to Dr. Seuss. I dressed up as the cat in the hat with red and white hat and tie and white gloves and the whole outfit. Then um, Leonardtown Elementary School Food Services and Nutrition Services had recognized National School Breakfast Week and it was called Hear the Maryland Crunch where each student was given an apple and at the count of three they all crunched and they loved the apples. They were so juicy that it was just running down my arm as I bit into the apple and that was wonderful to promote healthy eating. Then they had the Galaxy Breakfast Glow program as part of the same thing where they had new menu items, prizes, and special events for the students. So everybody in the school system is on board to do everything to increase student achievement, and everybody is working hard to make our students the best that they can be. And board members were at many other events, but we try to narrow it down so we don't spend a lot of time talking about all the places that we have gone, but this board is very busy going to places, schools, community events, whatever. We're invited to many things, so it's a pleasure to go and represent the, the school system. Thank you. Well, sadly this year I missed Read Across America because I was at NABE for a legislative meeting. Um, as you can tell, we're very active. Um, the legislature has a great many bills affecting um, education on their on their docket, and um, we're just trying to keep up with things. Uh, with respect to the the vaping issue, I had an opportunity uh, last fall to talk to um, someone from the Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene with respect to what I thought was a mistake in having removed the penalty for um, possession uh, or, or being found vaping. And I was told, no, that they did that on purpose because they um, felt that um, students were being disproportionately hurt and they wanted to go after the retailer inse instead. Um, I have spent this session trying to convince legislators that um, we need to go back to having um, this, this tool. Uh, and when I met with uh, resistance on that, one of the things I've pointed out is this may be the only opportunity for a parent to understand that their child is vaping. And so um, while yes, the parent may be the one who winds up paying the civil penalty, um, it is the opportunity for that parent to have a good conversation with their child. And anytime a parent can have a, a meaningful conversation with their child about something so important as an impact to their life, I think um, it behooves us to make sure we give them that opportunity, even if it does mean um, a civil penalty for um, being ticketed for this. Um, so I do hope that the legislature will um, will agree to uh, bring forward a bill um, so that we have this again at our disposal. Um, and with respect to the Kerwin legislation, heaven only knows what's gonna come out of that um, at the end of it. Um, there are just lots of moving pieces and so um, we'll see. Um, but uh, until then, I guess we'll figure out coronavirus. Uh, yeah, yeah, so oh, that was quite a lead in. There you um, go, I will say that. So Kerwin had, uh, has passed the House with, I think, 65 to 70 amendments. It is currently uh, being heard in the Senate this in the next several days. It's in committee. It's in committee right now. And um, there are, I think, up to 100 additional amendments. So for all of you who may have read the Kerwin legislation when it first came out, the first 200 pages, please understand that the legislation is, is, that's currently moving forward has been will have been fairly heavily modified. So uh, this weekend we'll all have homework to do once again to see where it has ended um, after several very uh, active days of discussion and debate and amendment. So um, 
I'm going to end with Kerwin. Or I'm going to end. I'm going to start with Kerwin and end with Corona. Okay, but in the mid, in the middle, there's been a lot of really the same, there's right? been a, there's been a lot of really great things going on. Um, the all county elementary school band and strings that uh, that Mr. Davis referred to that was a really great event. That was so much fun. I got to sit next to Todd Burrow's mother, who was there to see her granddaughter, who Mary was Thompson. who was who was playing. It was it was just it was it was a really great night. Um, uh, I did uh, go up again. So traveled to Annapolis <laughs> earlier this week again. It is such a joy um, uh, to perf- to provide. Yeah, I, I did get parking this time. I, I got I still have somebody's space down below, so that was really nice. Uh, but to provide testimony um, for a bond bill that Senator Bailey has put in for a hundred thousand dollars to go towards the Choptecon High School renovation of their press box and related storage underneath. $100,000 would come from the bond bill, and then we would have matching $200,000 of local funds. Um, we're very appreciative for the opportunity to talk about something that would really benefit one of our schools um, quite substantially. So, also did a whole bunch of uh, classroom visits. Uh, Piney Point, Leonardtown, Chesapeake Public Charter School, Park Hall Elementary School, Leonardtown High School. I'm about halfway through visiting all the schools to see our incredible Teacher of the Year nominee and our Education Support Professionals of the Year nominee, as well as touching in, stepping in with our um, new teachers. Yesterday I was at Leonardtown High School uh, recognizing uh, Mr. Adams and uh, Mr. Hancock, who is their Education Support Professional of the Year, and then having lunch with uh, a whole bunch of the, the new teachers. There were eight of them. There were eight of them at that school I- itself. So we all talked about how important it was to wash our hands and to say hello like this, and, and to, it, it, was, it was good. Um, so before I get to Corona, I want to talk about the calendar because people have asked questions about the calendar itself. And so if there were no Corona, <laughs> we would be coming at the next board meeting just to let you inform you that indeed we have used no inclement weather days. So our actual last day of school would be Monday, June 15th. As it would be a Monday, June 15th, we would be writing to MSDE to ask for a waiver because you can ask for a waiver if your last day of school falls on a Monday. So were it not for Corona, that is exactly what I would be informing you at our next meeting. If there is no interruption in service with St. Mary's County Public Schools, that would be our, our, path, our path forward. That being said, um, we are in constant communication with the EOC, okay? The EOC, which is the Emergency Operations Center, where we have all of the different arms of the local county government and supporting services, and they all get together to talk about the most recent news. So we are in constant communication. There is a weekly meeting as well as pretty much real-time communication if anything else comes up. There is the Joint Information Center that has been stood up, the JIC. So there's the EOC and the JIC. All this information, it's, it's, it's real time, it's real time. And it's very important because there is so much information and then oftentimes misinformation out there. Um, I was talking to Dr. Brewster yesterday, um, of the several times I've had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Brewster, and we'll continue to talk to Dr. Brewster, our health officer, um, because there was, a, there was a lot of speculation out in the community about you know, rumors about confirmed cases in St. Mary's County. And as of today, as of this morning, there are no confirmed cases in St. Mary's County. Will that change? Perhaps. I don't know. I can't tell the future. Um, but everybody does need to know that we are all in fairly constant communication and having updated information in real time. The decisions we make today are based on the information that we have today. So. As of today, we have canceled all school field trips out of state. We are moving forward with all the field trips that are in state as of today, as well as Washington, D.C. That may change depending upon what happens in Washington, D.C. and what happens in the larger centers of Maryland. Um, but we are in constant communication with the people who are organizing the field trips and where they're going, and we're considering all of that. So basically, if not every day, every other day, we're going through all the field trip lists, taking a look at all the places that people are, where they're going, and things such as that. 
all of our field trips, they're following all of the healthy protocols with washing your hands and having all of that. And we are, we are following all of those protocols as well. We have been in a cleaning stance at our school since flu season started where we are much more aggressively wiping down common touch areas, which is really the recommendation that so far we're receiving from the Maryland State Department of Education as well as other health organizations. So um, we're just going to, everybody's just going to need to really pay attention. We're going to communicate as, as, as we move forward. Um, it is a challenge when we have all of the university systems of Maryland shutting down as of today, extending their spring break and then forecasting that they might be closed another two weeks after that. Recognize that's a college campus decision. That's because they have students resident. School systems are not universities. We have much larger responsibilities, especially for our littlest learners, our medically fragile learners, as well as all of our other children. And so it's very appropriate that we're going to be recognizing all of those people who are work in the larger spectrum with our children because a decision to close a school or to quarantine or that has absolute repercussions. We have 18,000 students in our school system that impacts 36,000 parents, which means that half of this county is directly related to what goes on in the school system. So we don't make any decision lightly. We use all of the information that we have in real time and we move forward there. Everybody, please just pay attention. It's also budget season. Pay attention for that, too. And with that, I conclude my remarks for the day. 17 days till spring break. It is 17 <laughs> days to spring break. So. For the cough. Way to end it, Kathy. Sorry. Good job. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, first, we have our recognitions. Uh, Ms. Long. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> such segues everywhere yes. today. We're doing such mm -hmm. a good job on it. Joining me this morning is Robin Schrader, our mental health coordinator, sure. to um, celebrate and show appreciation for our school social workers. St. Mary's County Public Schools joined with the School Social Work Association of America in recognizing our school social workers during the week of March 1st through the 7th. Our school social workers, currently in our middle and our high schools, help students meet the academic, social, and emotional challenges on the road to becoming successful and productive young adults. This school year, our team has provided direct mental health services to over 500 students, supporting concerns related to depression, self-esteem, coping, conflict management, truancy, academic success, and substance use. Services to students include a 12-week prevention intervention program that focuses on mental health and wellness, building resiliency and coping tools, aftercare services following mental health hospitalization, and crisis and walking services. Our school social workers focus on the whole child, providing a valuable voice as part of the school's multidisciplinary team, advocating for the needs of students and linking families to community resources. So let's meet our team. I'm gonna ask them to come up as I give a short uh, introduction. Ashley Flores at Margaret Brent Middle School. Ms. Flores began her work with adults and adolescents in recovery from addiction and trauma. Her experience includes work in an inpatient and outpatient treatment setting, providing assistance to domestic violence victims and in-home services to at-risk families. Ms. Kimberly Hall at Spring Ridge Middle School has 20 years of experience in the field of social work, 15 of those working with children and families. Her experience includes work with hospice, inpatient psychiatric treatment, treatment foster care, and community in-home services. Ms. Megan Kirsch at Leonardtown High School has worked in schools, psychiatric hospitals, nonprofit community agencies, hospice agencies, and private practice. She has extensive experience serving children who have experienced physical, emotional, and medical trauma. Ms. Lindsay Robeson was raised in St. Mary's County and graduated from Chattagon High School. A recent graduate from Salisbury University, she's very excited, and we are as well, that she's back with us at Chattagon providing mental health and behavioral health counseling uh, support to our students. Ms. Kara Scarborough at Esperanza Middle School. Her experience includes mental health counseling, in-home family intervention services, and work in hospice. Ms. Amy Shryock at Fairlead 1 and Fairlead 2. Her experience includes work in child welfare, medical social work, and mental health. 
Ms. Glory Van Brunt could not be with us today. Uh, she's at Great Mills High School, and her experience includes work in residential treatment programs for adolescents, mood disorders, abuse, and trauma. Ms. Adel Allison Vandenbos at Leonardtown Middle School grew up in Southern Maryland. Her experience includes work in a mental health clinic with school-based and substance abuse programs. And as Dr. Smith is coming up to join us for the resolution, I also want to recognize our two social work interns from Salisbury University that are with us this morning too, Ms. Laura Grassinger and Ms. Katie Tippett, who have been learning about the practice of social work and providing um, counseling services in our elementary, middle, and high school. Oh, you're not going to come up? Uh. <laughs> I think I think the next generation of social workers should right. come up as well. <laughs> and Leonard High School Grant. Brett, Brad. Class yeah. of? <laughs> when you graduate from Cobb County? 2014. 2014. I'll tell you. We, we are a community, community de dedicated to um, children. All right, I'm going to read the resolution, and I'm going to say a couple of things. And if afterwards any of you want to say something, so if you're sitting there and you have a burning desire, like I really want to grab that mic from Scott and I want to say a few things, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll say a few things. Whereas school social workers in Maryland serve as, a, as vital members of the educational team, playing a central role in creating a positive environment at schools, and whereas school social workers in Maryland are especially skilled in identifying and providing services to students who face serious challenges to school success, success, including poverty, disability, discrimination, abuse, addiction, bullying, loss of a loved one, and other barriers to learning. And whereas school districts and local educational agencies should continue to work with school social workers to address students' social, social emotional, physical, mental health, and environmental needs so that students may achieve academic success, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of St. Mary's County recognizes March 1 through 7, 2020 as School Social Work Week in St. Mary's County Public Schools and that all staff and students are encouraged to recognize this event and participate in its observance and assign the 11th day of March by the Board of Education. I would just like to give you all a round of applause. And just say thank you very much for those of you who have been through St. Mary's County Public Schools, gone up to college and coming back, thank you very much. For those of you who have joined, how many people have just joined us this year? Everybody was brought on this year, right? That's fantastic. It's quite a commitment to the social, emotional, and mental health of our children. And it's a quite, quite a testament to not only the work that you two have done, but working with the county government as well to secure the funds to be able to do this. And we have been already told we have the funds moving forward for next year. We have, so this is something that will continue uh, certainly for the next several years, if not permanently. So school funding is very important because school funding allows us to do fantastic things for our children. So absent of any comment by all of you, no? Well, just thank you very much. <laughs> to approve the consent agenda? I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Uh, it's the minutes of February 26, 2020, um, and vehicle purchase for Head Start. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. And we will begin with Mr. Witten and HVAC at Town Creek. here today to talk to you about Town Creek Elementary School. So um, today um, I'm here to request approval uh, to award a contract to Citywide Mechanical in the amount of $89,500 for the replacement of the HVAC, HVAC's water chiller system at Town Creek Elementary School. Water chiller is a cooling device inside the school. The HVAC system's water chiller at Town Creek Elementary School is in need of a major repair at a cost of about $65,000.
The replacement cost is about 90, was estimated at 98, came in at 89.5. The age of the existing unit is 21 years. The life expectancy for this particular type of chiller is 15 to 25 years. The parts availability is sparse and to non-existent, which drove the price of the repair from an initial estimate before they checked on the availability of the parts of about 15 to 20,000, drove it to 65 because an outside firm actually would have to go back and manufacture something that hadn't been manufactured for a while. The replacement water chiller will allow for improved operational performance and reliability. The existing water chiller consists of one variable speed compressor and one refrigeration circuit. This increases on and off cycling and does not allow for um, partial uh, load redundancy or partial redundancy if uh, something fails in one circuit, the, it's cooling or no cooling. The replacement chiller that we expect uh, will have two chillers, I mean, sorry, two compressors, two circuits allowing variable load response to the cooling load, and uh, the two refrigeration circuits will allow partial redundancy. If a, a mechanical or electronic apparatus in one of the circuits goes bad, you still have the other circuit to run. So one third to 50% cooling will still be, be available. Uh, the contract information, the contract will basically replace the existing chiller, water chiller uh, at Cal Cal Creek Elementary School. The work uh, is contracted for 90 days. I have talked to the uh, recommended vendor for award and they can stick to the 90 days completion. Uh, which puts us at late May to early June, depending on when they receive the PA. Uh, the contract was issued with a three-year warranty on everything and a five-year warranty on the compressor, which includes the parts, labors, and the refrigerant. Sometimes uh, compressor warranties don't include the labor and the parts, just, uh, just the, the compressor replacement. The procurement method was an invitation to bid, uh, SMCPS 2020 MWCR, was issued on February 4th, 2020 and posted on email and marketplace and the SMCPS Purchasing Office's bid board. In accordance with the Annotate Code of Maryland, Article 5-112 and Board Policy DJC and Regulation DJCR. <coughs> the SMCPS Purchasing Office requested sealed bids for experienced and qualified contractors to perform the replacement of the HVAC systems water chill at Town Creek and on February 18th, 2020, six sealed bids were received and opened. Citywide Mechanical was the lowest responsive bidder and fully met the requirements of solicitation. With that, we're uh, recommending that the board approve this agenda item as presented. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, what type of um, work has Citywide done in the past? Have they done work for the school system in the past? Or they're, they're currently the contract, the subcontractor who's doing the renovation at Hollywood Elementary School. Okay, so they're currently doing something. I have a question on this bid tabulation. I mean, because there's such a wide range of prices here. Um, you know, from the water chiller replacement to the hourly rate to the markup percentage for additional ma materials. So, um, but the markup percentage, is that what they, this is if they run into uh, problems and need to get additional parts, or is this something how they tabulated their, um, their total price to begin with? The way the contracts, the way we typically issue these is we issue these, uh, items two and three basically are negotiated change order rates. Oh, okay. So anything above and beyond what was in the initial contract that you, we may run into, we've already negotiated the hourly rate and the percent markup on materials for those change orders. Instead of trying to negotiate those at the same time, you're trying to figure out how to solve a problem and get the parts. Okay. So this is in addition to, like, if, if they have to get other materials that they did not anticipate, this is where the markup comes? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I noticed that uh, the Calvert Controls is very close. Yes. Thirteen hundred dollars, something like that, uh, a delta. Um, you you took the uh, citywide at the lowest responsible bid. Yes. And I I guess because those bids are so close, what were the determining factors to make citywide more responsible? Well, um, the, we look at all the bids and all the responses and look at their qualifications and we look at their familiarity with St. Mary's County Public Schools and, and how often they've worked with us and, 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 and our experience with them in the past. Um, 
Calvert Controls, to my knowledge, in the past 13 years has not done any work with St. Mary's County Public Schools. Uh, citywide, um, although um, they are doing Hollywood Elementary School, I did, um, I did interview and talk with uh, the project manager running Hollywood, well, both project managers running Hollywood Elementary School Innovation. Um, I guess uh, it, was, it, it basically came down to the lowest responsive price, and the rest of the vendors were familiar with W.O. Gary. We've done work with MCOR. We've done work with American Combustion. We've done work with Citywide, Clark Mechanical, and Calvert. Uh, we have not done uh, work with, to my to my knowledge, in the past thir about 13 years now. So. Uh, the only other question, uh, it's, it's going to take 90 days uh, to bring the chiller online, which will be in June. So you're not going to have any cooling on, I assume. We will. We will have temporary cooling. Will. Oh, you're going to put temporary cooling? Yes. And that's factored into the, 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 the price of the? No, sir. That's a separate. Who's paying for the uh, the operating uh, the operating budget? Other operating budget. Yes. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, if I can say something. Mm -hmm. um, based on the um, repair costs and the age of the system, it only makes economic sense to replace the unit. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think when you look at items two and three, um, with respect to Calvert as well as um, citywide, um, it, you know you can. <coughs> they, they're they going to put the, the cost in one place or the other, and obviously they just chose to do it quite a little bit differently. Um, you believe that the construction contingency that you that we will authorize of, of uh, 12500 will cover um, any uh, unexpected costs? Yeah, we were careful to, um, we, we spent uh, quite a bit of time making sure that the replacement chiller we spent would, would fit in, so there's, there's minimal work that needs to be done. It's all outside the building. This chiller is actually mounted on the roof. It's not inside a mechanical room. Or in an enclosure, so we expect minimal. Uh, maybe a couple, maybe ten foot of pipe needs to be rearranged that wasn't accounted for, but I, I don't foresee anything major. And since it's outside the building, they'll be able to do the work um, during the school day. Yes, w well, the majority of the work. There is one little exception when they set the chiller and they move the old chiller. No one can be in the structure because right. a crane will be above it. But mm -hmm. other than that, yes. Very good. That's all I had. You answered my other questions. Anyone else? Okay. May I have a motion? I move that the Board of Education approve award of contract ITB SMCPS 2020 M WCR in the amount of $89,500 to Citywide Mechanical LLC for the replacement of the HVAC water chiller at Town Creek Elementary School. The board further authorizes a construction contingency of twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Is that a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Howard, some technology purchases. Good morning, board. Good morning. Good morning. I brought um, project coordinator Kenny Gextat with me today to talk about a couple of the um, items that we're going to be asking for approval on today.
Today we're here to um, seek approval for um, a technology purchases for our E-rate program. Um, as some background, um, we've done, been doing this last few years. E-rate is a program offered um, by the FCC to help schools and libraries with communication costs. The program has enabled schools to apply for reimbursement for eligible expenses based on our um, current um, free and reduced um, meal um, eligibility or reimbursement rate, 60% of the purchase we get reimbursed. And um, the requirements for this is we must have a signed contract by March 25th this year. Um, and the application must be posted for 28 days on the, um, the USAC site. Um, and we also post it on email and marketplace. Um, and the qualified providers must be registered with USAC for us to be eligible. Um, I think I brought Kenny along to talk a little bit about the proposed network infrastructure refresh. Um, so for the network infrastructure, <coughs> we're focusing on three areas, our network core, our internet edge, and then also our data center networks. Um, in our network core, we'd like to upgrade our core switches so that we can increase more sites and eventually bring all of our sites to an uplink speed of 10 gigabits per second. Um, our network firewall, uh, we've seen an increase in traffic due to just the nature of streaming media on the internet and also BYOD. So we'd like to um, increase our capacity on our network firewalls to um, add additional content filtering for students and then also make them more resilient if we have any uh, external attacks on our infrastructure as well. Um, and then in our data center, we've been aggregating more of our applications to our core infrastructure. And with that has come an increase in data traffic and the need for bandwidth. So we're looking to uh, upgrade switches in our data center as well to add some additional 40 gig links to go between our racks and allow for increased data capacity there. <coughs> um, we work with um office friends been very helpful we've also worked with our e-rate consultants um, on the various components um, the solicitation was on the 470 form that by the guidelines for the FCC and the um, RFPs were um, posted on email and marketplace um, and the um, various components um, again we're going to be focusing on data cabling and fiber um, we want to make an award to Layer 1 Technologies in the amount of $56,050. Um, um, we've worked with Layer 1 in the past. They have um, been a very accommodating company and done very good work for us. Um, they also did the PA system at Esperanza um, last year. Um, we also have a, at attachment D is for the network firewall, and that's a Skyline Technology Solution. Um, they're one of the larger IT infrastructure companies in Maryland. Um, they handle um, most of the work for the state's fiber network, so they're a very, very good company to work with. And the firewall proposal came in um, at 238,437. And the network core switches is to um, CDW in the amount of 77,290. And those components will go at the um, two data centers we have currently. <coughs> and did a little table here to show you the, um, the way coordinating all these purchasings, how it impacts us on the bottom line. Um, you know, total cost is 371,000. The E-rate amount that we could get a max eligibility is over 200,000 that's coming back to us. And our cost at the end would be about $150,000. 
for any questions at this point, but we would like um, the board to approve this agenda item as presented. I'm sorry for the delays getting us started today. That's okay. <laughs> How will this deal with the issue of students using VPNs to get around the firewall? Um, so we're looking to add additional features to our firewall to prevent that. That is a very difficult um, thing to mitigate because of the nature of VPNs, and especially the ones that we're seeing are more of the, um, they're built for the anti-censorship use for people that are running VPNs in China or countries that do limit access to the internet. So they're, they're very evasive pieces of technology. So that's one of the things that we're looking to do when we upgrade the firewall to add more robust capabilities for blocking those type of uh, software products internally and making sure that we're um, able to properly validate that the traffic going from inside our network to the internet is being scanned appropriately. Thank you. I like how you have uh, broken it down to three different areas. I think it's more economical to, instead of just going out as one bid overall. So I like how you, you know, you break it down to different areas. I have another question. I, I, I thought it was very interesting that you have a um, committee that meets and voting and non-voting members to evaluate what is needed, what services and what type of equipment is needed. I, I was really impressed with that. Um, do you work at all with the county? Like say you were talking about the library, do you work at all with them to bring them into your committee to um, kind of see what the needs are that we could we maybe haven't. work together or you haven't? Not on those types of purchases. I know in the past we've worked together like we both use the same voice over IP phone systems um, and we do you know information share from time to time but um, recently um, we've, you know they have a lot of similar technologies we already have um, okay so we have a pretty good relationship with our county IT department okay great thank you um, I like your weighted average analysis and I have no comments <laughs> my only question on the um, on the data ca cabling and fiber so Fairlead and Lexington Park have exponential price uh, costing uh, costed out amounts rather than the other three schools or four schools. Is it just because of uh, of actual volume of the cabling, or is it more uh, barriers due to the infrastructure of the building? A lot of the buildings, um, we we feel that we just need to upgrade the um, internal like the. The communication closets in between the sites which gives the fiber link and those cost it, it's they can get that done in a couple of days mm -hmm. but when they're running all new wiring to some of the sites that really need it that's when they're they have crews in there for you know weeks at times okay. so it's the amount of cabling and the amount of work okay so in looking at this then in your response so Fairlead and Lexington Park mm -hmm. we're probably gonna see an upgrade overall where the yep. other ones are just gonna have different uh, hubs now for you know, for connection. Yeah, and so. which will increase the bandwidth with within the building. Right. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No questions. Thank you. Thanks. Um, on the bid tab for the data cabling and fiber, um, you have six place, six schools or sites um, listed, but uh, one has no cost Park associated. Hall. Right. Yeah. Um, what's going on there? Um, Park Hall, we had put in for last year's E-rate, and we weren't sure if the vendor could come in and do it this year, so without knowing that for sure, we went ahead and reapplied again in case <coughs> we couldn't get it done this school year. Okay. So that's why we were able to get it completed ahead of time. So it's still an E-rate eligible from our last um, go at it. So the work will be done, it's Correct. just it's not a specifically a cost item in this. It's, it's, on, last, it's on last year's. Last year's, yeah. right. Last um, year's E-rate. And then um, when do you anticipate this work will be done? Um, there are a couple things. Um, some of the wiring projects, I think we, we can find the money for because they're smaller jobs. But like the firewall is going to be dependent upon um, a budget that we can work off of. Um, so I, I know we have some of this in for um, in the budget. If it makes it in next year, we can assess and make that decision. It gives us all the way up to June 30th to have the product installed next um, next year. Okay. Um, so we'll probably come and ask for more technology dollars at some point. Um, given the the issues with um, the security of the infrastructure of the system, um, I do hope that we will 
um, keep the firewall piece in um, yeah. in, in here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's we would love that, and we're going to look at um, at trying to implement this as best we can, and then make sure we have the skills. Um, it's a, it's going to be a different manufacturer, different um, platform. So I want to make sure my team is very comfortable with the operations of it. Um, but yeah, it's a big big item. And uh, given that, I, and I'm assuming that this would be a one-time cost? Uh, there's reoccurring costs um, for so support for almost anything you buy now to keep it current, but updated. For the firewall, there would be? There is, yeah, renewal costs, licensing. Um, and I think we did a three-year cost analysis to help with the vendor, too. And with, with this one, it, it was the most cost-effective. And the system what we're looking at is most school districts are using it, too. So it's um, got a good track record. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, I appreciate it. I, th I think that uh, the firewall especially is um, crucial, definitely. All right. May I have a motion? I move that the board approve contract awards of contract A, data cab cabling and fiber to layer one technology solutions at the unit prices shown on the bid tabulation for purchases totaling $56,050. Contract B, Edge Firewall to Skyline Technology Solutions at the unit price is shown on the bid tabulation for purchases totaling $238,437. And Contract C, Core Switches to CDW Government at a cost of $77,290 through use of the MEEC hardware contract UMD 972016. Further, the board approves the use of the unit price contracts A, B, and C as funding permits throughout the duration of the contract term, which would could be valid through March 31st, 2023. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson, for being here today and being our subject matter expert on the spot. It's very thank good. You. And for the board, I would like to thank you. Over the last six years, you have invested millions and millions of dollars for technology in the classroom and then all of the related technology to make sure that the technology in the classroom works. And a lot of times there's some lopsided growth and we've been very balanced in that we don't bring on devices unless we know that we have the infrastructure and support and security on the back end. And so Dave, please bring back to your team and Kenny specifically, Thanks. they've got some really just fantastic people working on all of this. This is some of the most creative, innovative, brilliant technologists um, I've seen in a, in a system. And um, especially when we have things like we had the interruptions that we had last, last week, it really, it's amazing to see them swing into action and come up with solutions. It's, it's great. It was a rough week for us, but <laughs> yeah, we had a good busy. team really pulled together and yeah. did everything we could. And uh, yeah. we were over the county UConn building for Absolutely. a lot last week. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now you I'm understand more about my concern lately. about the firewall. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. But Absolutely. thank you all, and you all have done a great job and supported me, but <coughs> it's so, so really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Dr. Jaffers and Ms. Bachner. Whites and, oops. Yeah, we only have eight. I know. Eight, eight, eight slides. slides. Oh my eight slides, and it's like twice in two meetings. Yeah, yeah. you have. <laughs> I, I think you are. Actually, Dr. Jaffers is just this smiling. is true. It was four slides when Alex first and I we made it up to eight. So I was like, it just looks so fair. This must be your new resolution. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, isn't it, Alex? It's been got, yeah. <laughs> Direction, I guess, I'll be <laughs> directing. So your, your job security is to decide how many slides. <laughs> <laughs> Got to build in some, some security somewhere. Well, good morning. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, Lisa and I will discuss um, the uh, updates from the MSDE uh, last board meeting, February uh, 24, which would include graduation and also for uh, some of our science assessment updates. Um, so um, they, um, the update is, uh, is uh, they've locked in the cut score for MCAP, uh, ELA, and Algebra 1 to be 725 for all students. Uh, and this is all rooted in data, uh, which is always a, a good reassuring thing. Um, students who graduate in 2019, 2020, which is our current seniors, and 2020, 2021, which is our current juniors, uh, those school years need only to participate in the MCAP 
assessments for ELA 10 and Algebra 1 respectively, meaning that they only need one participation score. They don't have to meet a 725. They just have to participate, meaning take the test. Uh, these cohorts, again, uh, do not need to complete bridge projects either uh, in order to meet the graduation requirements. So a matter of for sitting juniors and seniors, the expectation is that they just sit uh, for the MCAP exam for ELA and Algebra 1. Um, students graduating in the 2021-2022 school year and beyond must pass or bridge um, for both ELA uh, 10 and Algebra 1 assessments respectively. So that would mean our sophomores, our sitting sophomores would have to, the, the expectation for 725 and, uh, and or bridge would um, uh, be on those uh, individuals. So, and, and recognize, so with that, they will be sitting, the majority of them will be sitting for the exams this year, and they will be required to score a 725 or greater to meet that graduation requirement, so our current sophomores. Yeah, the indefinite pronoun, they, so you're saying those current sophomores, that's correct. Right, um, they. So current sophomores absolutely have to, whether they're in Algebra 1 or ELA 10. Right. That's right. But, you're, but what's your, you're not in Algebra 1. In this, if this, so if you, if you are in the class of 2022, right. you're in the class of 2022, right. whenever you take the MCAP ELA or the algebra. But they took an algebra one test last year. The and they, the 725 is their score. score. Yes, applied. is their score, yes. Okay. Yes. So they didn't get a 725, but they took it like their eighth grade year. Right, then right. Yes. Then they, have to then they would have to break. Take it again. Or take, take it again. the test again. Or they could right. retake the test. Um, that really isn't the case. The majority of people who take who took it in their eighth grade year, we had a ninety-eight percent seven fifty rate, and I think we had a hundred percent seven twenty-five. Hundred percent. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, John. Thank you. Between you, you both just oh, asked the question. Yeah, right. Yeah. I was like, we had a bunch of kids that are in algebra one in tenth grade. So. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. They're the class of 2022. We actually had a cohort of kids last year, seventh grade in STEM, that took Algebra 1 in seventh grade, and they've all passed with a 725. Right. Yes. Right. And we had a bunch of kids that took it in eighth grade. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and we had a 100% pass rate in 725. Right. Yep. So the thing they is like, they don't have to go back and check. You're, ch you're good. I'm good. <laughs> you're good. Like, Ellie, guess what? Brush up on Algebra 1. <laughs> no. So, so the motivation for these recommendations was based on um, the impact on students in local school systems. Um, and again, um, so the fact that we don't require the bridge and or these assessments to come back, um, uh, students to be reassessed and take the bridge without the benefit of testing data, they've delayed the, the, um, the reach of, you know, when we get this, this data back, it would have, it would have caused some heartbreak and heart, heartburn for all of us, including the students, um, because we wouldn't have gotten it back till on this time next year. Um, uh, it, it would have created some uh, uh, course scheduling headaches and uncertainty for the next school year. Uh, and again, it would have communicated a failure um, of expected failure, I should say, for students and families. So that's the motivation from MSDE. Um, and right. again, uh, the data was supported um, by the uh, MARC, which is the Maryland Assessment Research Center. Uh, and again, uh, in the next couple slides, you'll see students who have earned a 725 in the Park Algebra 1 and ELA 10 have been successful in college um, longitudinally. And uh, those students that have had 750 and above uh, are achieving at, five, at far higher levels than what's indicated uh, and quantified as quote unquote college success. So stop before you leave there, just, yes. just again, just to remind everybody that the students who will sit for the MCAP assessments this year, coming up in a month and a half, yes. right, a month and a half, we are not anticipating, MSD has told us that we will not get their, their score reports back officially until the following January or February. So they will take the test this in a few weeks. Yes, yeah. we won't have because there's, it's a testing window. We will not have those scores back until we are past the halfway mark of the following year. And just for the viewing public, these tests are they you know long written answers? <coughs> are they um, wh what exactly is the test? Because I would like to understand. What is the holdup well, well, in the new <laughs> providing? <laughs> this is the new MCAP. That's right. Yeah. I'm seeing it that. is a shorter That's right. test. That's right. And so as a result, they're going to have to go back and have their standard setting That's right. range, range finding. That's so right. they do standard setting, range finding, and then they go back and manipulate 
all the, the information and communicate that out. That's it, that's great. And um, once they get through that in the coming year, does that mean that subsequent years we can expect this information to come back, these test scores to come back in a timely fashion so that if course changes need to be made or um, adjustments to instruction need to happen that... Well, the goal after they do this, this is a static test. The test then in 2021 will be adaptive. Correct. And it's assumed that the responses, the results will come back <coughs> quite quickly. Correct. That is the that is the that is the that is the machine that they are building. That we would ha that we would have much faster turnaround time for results. Okay. So it's a one year. It's an aberration of one year. One so year. got it. Ben, can I just add one thing? Um, I, I know we typically kind of pound on Dr. Salmon <laughs> and MSDE, <laughs> but if anyone listened to the discussion during the board meeting on between the Maryland State Board and our state school superintendent on what these cut scores should be. Um, she, she did a phenomenal job because uh, they wanted it to be a lot higher. Um, she had a lot of experts there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which you've alluded to, and actually translated what the 725 score was, uh, which I think is your next slide, yeah. maybe, onto what an actual GPA is. <coughs> and at one point even challenged everyone on the on the State Board of Education to float out their transcripts from their for freshman year in college um, to see how they fared, it, you know, and perhaps they were, you know, setting a bar that was uh, still achievable, but yet too high, and yet a lower, a lower one still translated into success in college, so. Right, Un unrealistic and inappropriate. I don't mean to steal your thunder on the next no, slide. <laughs> I did. No, Sorry. No, no thunder here. Yeah, that's um, again level threes. Um, and again, be, mi be mindful. This is not. We're not talking about grade three or grade four. We're talking about graduation requirements. Right. Uh, level three is known as approaching. Uh, level four is meeting grade level expectations or course level expectations. And you can see on the on this table here that as you approach quote unquote approach grade level or course level expectations, the mean GPA was at two point nine six for for college. Uh, and as you approach level four, it's at a significant 3.34 um, uh, for Algebra 1. For ELA 10, uh, you would be at 3.14 in college level coursework um, because it's the longitudinal data system that they've captured. Uh, and then for level four, which would be um, meeting grade level expectations at 3.22. So uh, that's, a, that's a college level GPA, which is uh, exceptional. And I think everybody, as you said, would be envious of that sort of uh, grade So grade. did they go out, like, just to the colleges in Maryland, like, all colleges, or did they just go particularly, like, say, the University of Maryland and sort out right. students? She had, she had a panel that actually yes. extrapolated the data and translated what this GPA, what this, what this park performance level right. score would extrapolate into, mm -hmm. into a GPA at a college level. So okay. it wasn't, so it, wa it wasn't like a survey. I mean, if, I'm sure Dr. Jaffers could greatly well, better explain the mathematical I mean, iterations, but. I mean, it's definitely the power of big numbers. They really, um, we didn't add those slides. The, the sample size was large, and they had representatives from every county in the, in the, in the, uh, in the state of Maryland mm -hmm. as to what they were doing um, post-secondary. Uh, so mm -hmm. it was very, um, uh, it was very persuasive. Mm -hmm. So before you leave this slide, so the park assessment that they've created, and here this is MCAT <laughs> created, <laughs> There's three different scores. You can get a one, a two, a three, a four, or a five. Now, in the history of public education, we've always had a five grade system. There's an A, a B, a C, a D, and an F. <laughs> so when they rolled this out, they said, great, we've got five levels. Four and five is on grade level, which is a, which in my mind, an English teacher's mind, truly, but a B or an A. And then they said for everybody in the state of Maryland, proficient is B. Anything that's less than a B is not proficient. And in fact, for all the kids that are in high school, if you don't have a B, you don't get to pass, you don't get to graduate from high school. And so it took Dr. Salmon and the Maryland Longitudinal Data System and the Mark organization right. to do all of these data analytics to cast it all out to do all of this incredibly doctoral level very high level work to come back to show us 
that indeed, if you got between a 725 and a 749, we forecast this out at the college level, that equated to a 2.96, which is a very high, almost close enough, I would say rounded up to a B, but <laughs> let's say it's a C. It turns out all the data shows that they designed a perfect test that gave them an F, a D, a C, a B, or an A. The state said Bs and As are the only thing that matter. And that's still the measure that they're using for all of our littlest children from grade three all the way up. They're saying a B is all that's acceptable. Cs, no, you are, you are below standard. I would imagine that when we get to it and we go through all of this iteration and we go through all of the analytics, if we were to apply a similar model saying that if you got a 725 in third grade, how did you do in middle school grades? You'd see a similar study. If you did middle school and put it up to high school, you'd see a similar study. So perhaps the issue is more the semantics of calling yes. a C approaching. Yes. If they would, if they would, you know, basically take this and back map it, right. they would perhaps determine that the word approaching is uh, is not particularly descriptive. Well, I would say it's, it's elitist is what it is. Yeah. If, I, if I am a university president, I might have a certain view of somebody who earns a C. If I was a superintendent who attended a community college, I might recognize that a C earns credit. C equals credit. So... Good stuff. I loved. I loved watch. I lo if you're gonna watch one state right. board meeting, <laughs> I'd watch. Asleep, I'd it? watch that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It definitely showed people's true disposition towards what we're doing in public education and why we are assessing children. Because the whole purpose for assessment isn't to punish and isn't to discriminate. It's to determine whether they're making adequate progress to prepare them for the next thing in life. It's college and career ready. And so if we have an assessment that says 725 means that you are ready to earn a high C, almost B in college, good for you. Good for you. Fun stuff. Soapbox now put away. <laughs> it will come back out like that in about three minutes. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping I've vented my spleen. Um, for those of you who have been on the board for a little bit of time, we're going to go back a little bit. So um, the high school at the same meeting, they made the decision to um, do make some changes to the high school MISA. It will now be called the three-dimensional um, assessment. And I had to ask Mr. Hayes, who could not be here today, he's doing observations, like what does that mean exactly? Yeah. Yeah. And he says, if you remember when MISA was, we were putting um, science and engineering practices as well as cross-cutting cross um, concepts in all of our science courses. So those are the two pieces along with the content makes it 3D. So that's how they're still keeping those MISA components of what we added into the new assessment. So why did we do this? As Ms. Bailey said, they are listening to us because, and I think Dr. Smith can allude to this as superintendents brought this forth, of, of some of the issues and challenges we were having with the current MISA and that in the state of Maryland, science teachers are trained in specific certification areas. And when we went to MISA, it's an integrative science assessment so that meant that some of our courses had to have blended or integrated content to prepare students in time to take the test. So that provided some challenge to some of our teaching and definitely our curriculum over time. Um, also, the old MISA students had to take up to three courses from three different teachers over the period of three years in order to prepare for the MISA, to be ready for the MISA, and that provided a challenge. Um, also, the state at the time let all counties um, decide their own course and sequence of those science classes and where you were going to teach those things. So if you were in Anne Arundel County, you got to make a decision. Calvert got to make a decision. We all got to make our own decision, um, which sounds great until you have a poor kid who transfers from one county to another. Um, and then things are not so great um, for either the teacher or the student or the family who's, who's making those changes, um, which is the last part is that, that transfer of students. So um, they decided to go back. If you remember, we used to do an, an assessment, MSA after biology, um, and we're going to be placing that new 3D test after the life science or biology. And for this rationale, um, it still can be done within the fiscal confines of what the state has budgeted for because before MISA was one single test after those three courses, it's still one single test. 
that we'll be administering to students. There was some talk of three different tests, and the state board at the time declined that and went to this in that same board meeting. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. First. Um, there will be no interruption to federal accountability. It still meets the ESTA requirements for accounting um, as far as the science um, assessment. Um, it allows the science assessment to be linked to a single course, which means that students have that year of study with that teacher and take that uh, assessment at the end of that, that year of study. Um, we are still keeping all our other classes aligned to the NGSS and have still, they'll all have that cross-cutting concepts in it and they'll all have um, those engineering practices. We've embedded those in our curriculum. They're good things, we'll not be taking those out. So that is a good feature of what MISA was. Um, we can use, and this hasn't come out yet exactly which of, but they're thinking that you could use alternatives like AP tests and things like that in lieu of this assessment for kids transferring in, but of course we haven't had directive about that yet, um, so that's forthcoming. Um, all school systems have a biology course, so uh, that whole problem of kids coming to us from other states, other counties, that would mitigate that problem. Um, and it, it doesn't worry about sequence of courses. Uh, local school systems still can sequence their science courses as they wish in high school, um, and this still works for them. Uh, of course, it addresses the student transfers. So what does that mean in timeline? Because we're going back to square one with a brand new assessment. It means that we will do operational ad administration, so it means the students will just be sitting for the test to meet the graduation requirement with no score point requirement until the administration of January 2023. <coughs> that will be the first time that students actually have to pass this th new three-week test. Until that time, our students until 2023 in January and May only have to sit for the test to uh, pass or have the graduation requ requirement attained. So is the test developed? I do not know. No. I think they're in the midst of developing it. So if I have Let's, let's say a freshman right. who took biology <laughs> or you know in ninth grade then when when does he or she sit for this test did they yeah. already sit for the test they and have, it already counts or right now we, right, we've we have currently given the MISA and are giving the MISA at the end of biology uh, it depends on the cohort. it depends on the student on the student and the if they're in yeah. honors biology yes yes right. um, other students take it at either 10th or 11th grade yeah, right? depends regardless on what their course of study has it in um, so a ninth grader is in the class of 2023, uh -huh. correct? Okay. So um, that will that will, I guess so will be count. guidance forthcoming. Yeah. But my 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. But so I'm so I'm going to take biology in ninth grade and then not take this test until it's developed. Well, I, I think the guidance the probably year before be, you want to get as many kids uh, in front of the test before the. Um, well, actually, summer class. of 2023, that the current class, the current freshman class would have graduated. Right. right. The thing <laughs> is, it's not it's not the class of 2023. It's, it's the 2023 the administration. Right. 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 Okay. So whoever is taking it, whoever is in biology in that year and that administration, they might whatever class they're in, they will be expected to it hit. It starts with our eighth grade class right now. Well, it, it mm -mm. honestly it depends. It's just whoever in 2023, it's whoever's in biology, yeah. will be taking this 3D, 3D science assessment. See, 3D life science. 3D assessment. life science assessment. That's another one. So that it would be today's. Fifth graders? It, oh, it would it would totally it would totally depend. depend. Be be yeah, because uh, you're talking three years, so it would be it, it would be the sitting eighth graders right now, right? So yeah, sitting eighth graders right now, and that would be the, the, the I'd say if if we keep the se scope of sequence similar that we have now, the more uh, advanced students take biology ninth grade. So, th so those sitting eighth graders now that would take biology ninth grade, and again, there's it would be, and then those students that aren't as advanced, they would take the biology test in tenth grade. So, I, so again, we we, we don't guess, really sure. Right. I guess what I'm that. saying is that when you say first summer administration of high school 3D life assessment is summer of 2023, that 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 counts. Yes. Right. That would be today's fifth graders. They would be rising all the way through who might be the first year to do it. Well, it, yeah, so. And that's where we have to get the nitty gritty guidance. Yeah. You know, the, I, I, I would hope we get that. They're going to have to do the same thing that they're doing for MCAP this year mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Right. So whoever, whenever they finally get the finalized version and they put it out, they're going to have to then do standard setting. Okay, so here, here's where I'm finding. completely confused. So if your administration of the high school 3D life science assessment that counts for graduation is January and May of 23, that is not necessarily for those, for every student who is enrolled in 
school. There will be people who have already taken it. Right. right. So, so if I'm if I'm a freshman right now, I'm a class of 2020. And you're in biology. And honors. I'm in biology right now, but you're not telling me <laughs> because I'm going to take a biology assessment when I finish the class, correct? Yep. This year. You're going to take a MESA. Right. Yeah. So you're, you're not going to tell me that I have year. to come back now. No, and that's, no, no, no. that meets the no. graduation okay, requirements. Okay, because that's because that. They haven't. Been, mm. They haven't said. You no. just never know. The cla- for the class, <laughs> for the class. <laughs> right? Of, that's right. where we get you sick for that. <laughs> it's right. Okay. Time. Yes. For the, next, right. for the next three That's years, everybody who takes right. it is going to be just participation. <laughs> gotcha. All right. And that'll be our goal. Our goal as a system, most likely, we'll have as many students sit in front of the test <laughs> now to count for participation. Right. Yeah. Not okay. for the expectation of meeting the, ex- the, the, um, the All right. I'm just trying to make yeah. sure that no one is placing a requirement for a child to take a, a class two years ago and then, right. and then sit for the no. test. Anybody who's, anybody who's taking it this year, right. certainly the Great participation. A little bit yep. yeah. confusing with the timeline of this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's <laughs> it might not surprise. There, uh, there's my there's point, point taken. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. well, right. Well, it's, it's a real <clears throat> challenge. And, and just to get the... When they presented the MISA data to the superintendents in the in the last fall, mm-hmm. fall of 2019, and we all said, "Whoa, that's that's a really challenging number then to put out, and that can't be a graduation requirement because you are having all different ranges of kids right. sit in all different grade levels with, and we administered it at, at the ends of different courses. Right. That's that 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 data isn't very valid data. And then they went back and they wrote three proposals." And we ended up with this. So this again, this is a. The board made two very bold decisions that really do help us at the high school. Yeah, that's what we can't lose sight of. They really Mm -hmm. made some really good decisions that helped us locally. So. And that's a great assessment. Like it's a great assessment. They've looked at they've looked at some of the some of the assessment items and 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 everything like that. And I know that Mr. Hayes would agree. It's a it's a really rigorous and appropriate assessment. <laughs> no, we have a question during the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. It's a better dialogue. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's 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 going back and yeah. can you go back to slide four and all this other yeah, stuff? It makes so. the show so much more entertaining. Thank you all. <laughs> okay. We have it. I mean, the thing is, there are there are just so many things going on well, with education like, in the state of Maryland, right. and it it is truly a challenge to keep all of the moving pieces straight. Well, you've got good people working for our kids, I will tell you that. That is is quite evident, and um, all you need to do is uh, observe some other um, entities to to see that um, quality makes a difference. We have a lot of people who say that's a really good question. I'm, I, I don't know. Let's find that. Let's find that out. Which is great. You know, that's the that's the perfect disposition you want to have. That's a really good question. I'm not sure. Let's go find that out. I like the fact that they anticipate um, and are prepared with more than they just presented. Yeah. All right, Terry. What do you have? Good afternoon. Uh, we have the February financial report. On the revenue side, we are recognizing. $161.4 million revenues received year to date, which represents 71.25% of our budget. On the expenditure side, we have encumbrances outstanding of $89.1 million. Year to date encumbrances and expenditures have been recognized of $215.4 million, representing 95.10% of our budget. Um, Just one item of note, and that is that our health insurance is coming in below trend very positively, so we're currently at 97% for our projections. Do you have any other questions? Anyone? No. No. Okay. Thank Thank you. you. All right. Does anyone have anything else? No. All right. Our next board meeting will be March 25th at 6 p.m. We'll see everyone then.